the white witch podcast with me carly hope you are all well witches on today's episode we are looking at scottish folk magic so within that we will be looking at saining which is a form of purification and blessing animism elf shot all about juniper and how it was used in saining processes how druids worked with it, but also how you can use it within your purification processes and spell work. I was really keen to look into this as part of my own ancestral work, as I discovered earlier this year that I have a lot of Scottish ancestry. So I really wanted to look into practices that would have been used, but it also followed on from a curiosity around practices linked to smoke cleansing that would have originated in lands more native to me. Before we delve into that, our book review for today is Yoga for Witches, written by Sarah Robinson. I really enjoyed this book, firstly because it actually got me moving my body, but I am keen to read more books that cover witchcraft in a different way. This is a fusion of information in regards to ancient yogis, chakras, grounding, meditation, manifestation, visualization, tons of yoga routines that you can work on, mantras, writing your own spells, simples, Ayurveda, I think that's how you pronounce it, animal magic, so it delves into power animals, familiars, animal symbolism, how certain animals come up in myth and folklore, moon magic but with a moon magic yoga salutation that you can try sun magic earth magic which gets into spells with soil earth elementals and also how to create your own witch bottles sarah also delves into a lot around the goddesses which i really enjoyed I really enjoyed the fact this book offered up such different content and I'm just trying to move away from some of the Lee like Witchcraft 101 books for review on the show. Nothing wrong with any of those, just I feel like we all want to hear something a little bit different. I really like Sarah Robinson's work. If you haven't tried it out, the Insight Timer app is wonderful for meditation and short courses. It's a free app and I'm still being a cheapskate and I haven't signed up to the paid site, but there is so much on there and Sarah does have some amazing meditations. She has a lovely voice, so you might want to go and have a listen to some of her work. And I actually found Sarah was pretty much just narrating this in my head. This book has actually got like got me started on working out again. I've used the excuse for too long that obviously the gym has been shut down due to COVID and I've reveled in that excuse, but this book has got me moving my ass. I feel so much better. I've really enjoyed either doing a yoga or exercise practice since reading this, so definitely got me motivated. I hadn't realized how far back yoga and the craft have actually had links until I read the following quote that Sarah has at the beginning of her book by Alistair Crowley. Am I then supposed to be saying that yoga is merely the handmaiden of magic or that magic has no higher function than to supplement yoga? By no means. It is the cooperation of lovers The practices of yoga are almost essential to success in magic. So I absolutely love this book, especially as it's like coming to spring, we're all feeling a bit more motivated, a bit more active, like a bit more ready to get ourselves going again. So yes, absolutely recommend Yoga for Witches by Sarah Robinson. Join me after the break where we'll be talking all about Scottish folk magic.
So let's talk all about seining. Seining is the Scottish folk magic act of purification that was used to remove unwanted spirits that influence a person or environment. The word sane can mean to bless and it provides a charm for protection but also prosperity and fortune. To sane you would say a protective charm or prayer over an object in order to hallow it and awaken its purpose. I have some Scottish ancestry and a love of the land itself. It is somewhere I long to live one day and I regularly return to especially the Stirling area, where I always feel most at home and a form of recognition for the land somewhere in my soul. I wanted to share with you some of the history in relation to seining overall to understand what our ancestors would have carried out. Scottish folk magic is animistic with the belief that everything has a spirit, be it water, plants, a person or house. Saining was generally used for land, people and livestock. Whole communities would have been saned at festivals throughout the year at each quarter mark through fire saining ceremonies. And the main two would have been Beltane and Samhain. The fire for these ceremonies would have been lit from a sacred fire known as the need fire that was used to remove negative spirits from cattle. At the festivals, they would walk in between the flames or jump over the flames and embers. And this is, of course, an activity we see come up within many of the Sabbaths linked to fire. The community would also have lit their half fire from this sacred fire. Fire would be used to say newborn babies by midwives and mothers. Midwives would take a pine candle and twirl it around the bed three times in a sunwise or diocil direction. As they did this, they would speak a charm. Pine candles are resin-soaked pine wood that's found when a pine tree falls down and it's from the stump that's left behind. They are cut to two feet long and a third of an inch in diameter. Today, these are referred to as fat wood. It gives off a black smoke, it's aromatic, resinous, and it was often used for candles as it can burn for a long time or it would have been used to have lit fires. Saining cattle was used for healing cattle, following them experiencing being elf shot. Elf shot is a medical condition described in ancient medical texts where you are believed to be shot by invisible elves who shot at people or animals with invisible arrows subsequently causing sudden pains localised to a certain area of the body. When people would find stones in their fields and pastures in ancient times, they would often believe the tiny stones to be small arrowheads made by the fairies or the elves who had been out shooting the cattle. Stone arrowheads were called elf shots, fairy darts or elf arrows. The National Museums of Scotland holds a 19th century elf shot charm found in the Highlands. To this day, many of the Icelandic still believe in elves. This belief is so strong that protecting elven habitat is part of the environmental impact assessment process for them looking to break ground in the country. I kid you not. It is said that unseelie elves are supposed to attack people, whereas seelie elves are good elves. In Scotland and Northern England, the belief in elf shot was still common as late as the 18th century. The belief mainly revolved around horses and cattle, but some humans also claimed to have experienced it. Doctors would be unable to find any physical evidence of an elf shot wound. However, it was claimed that this merely demonstrated the skill of the elf marksman. The idea of being attacked by elves was eventually aligned with Christian ideas of demons. Medicinal remedies provided to anyone claiming to have experienced elf shot straddled the lines between both magic and religion. Remedies frequently included prayers and pagan concoctions. Old English medicinal remedies worked based on the properties of the plants involved. Other remedies were based more on sympathetic magic. Overall, it provided a holistic approach with a level of psychology. At no point within texts written on the prescriptions would they have mentioned the word spell, charm or magic, so they were considered cures over magic. 
Plants such as mugwort, plantain, shepherd's purse, nettle, betony, chamomile, crab apple, chervil and fennel were used. Boiled, mixed with soap and made into a salve to treat skin infections. They would have worked at times too as the medicinal properties of the ingredients were correct. An example is that they might have used binding plantain around the head of a migraine sufferer to protect the sufferer from spirits. However, at the same time, this is an anti-inflammatory, so it could have worked, albeit in a different way to that that they had hoped. They also produced a salve that was made up of cow bile, garlic, onion and leek. The salve was so potent it can kill the MRSA superbug. Many herbal concoctions would have been accompanied by charms or invocations. The nine herbs prayer would be sung by healers three times over each of the nine herbs during their preparation. Then they would sing the charm into the injured person's mouth, ears and wounds before applying the medicine. These rituals drew upon the power of numbers but also provided a form of entertainment. It enabled healers to create a special space for patients. Songs, rhymes or charms signified and set the stage that healing was about to occur. There is, of course, the placebo effect that if you believe a cure will work, it has a greater chance of doing so. A fact that wasn't lost on early medieval healers, despite them holding no psychology degrees, they knew of the mind and body connection. The law of attraction is rooted in the principle, like attracts like. And this principle really comes from the idea of sympathetic magic. The idea that if you do something to an object, it has an effect on that which the object represents. So an example is a remedy for swollen eyes. Ancient cure would be to remove the eyes of a raven before it was dead and place them onto the neck of a sufferer. The body is said to absorb the good eyesight of the raven. Overall, the concept is that this was a transference of power from one thing to another. And a major artery leads from the back of the neck to the eyes. So it is said that they may have been aware of this, hence applying the eyes to the neck. But back to our saining. So Scottish folk would often sane cattle using fire. This was often carried out by a fairy doctor and their assistant. The ritual would be carried out three times, playing into the symbolism of numbers again. Overall, it involved burning the sign of a cross onto a cow three times. They would take a small notch of the cow's ear, also to show that it had been affected by elf shot. Saining can also be carried out with water, seawater to be specific. And staining with water is said to be called lustration. There is a story of how at Imbolc, people would take a dip in the sea, cover their entire head and body with the seawater, and then they would all head off to the pub. This also happened on St Michael's Eve with horses, so the sea would be used to bless the horse and the rider. Stained water, known as forespoken water, would often be used to remove a curse, A person would drop three different stones of colour into water taken from a border stream that both the living and the dead have crossed. The colours of the three stones they would add to the water would be red, white and black. The water said like had to have been crossed by both the living and the dead and from a border stream as it was said to symbolise the liminal. It's said that stone scabbard would also represent the liminal too and again links to the practice of the sacred free and the spirits that are found in the sea. Testament to the knowledge that Scottish folk magic heavily draws on the principle that everything has a spirit. The following incantation would be used over the water. In the name of them that can cure or kill, this water shall cure all earthly ill shall cure the blood and flesh and bone, for ilka ain there is a stain. May they fleg all trouble, sickness and pain, cure without and cure within, cure the heart and horn and skin. The patient for whom the forsaken water was prepared for had to drink a part of it. Three palmfuls were sprinkled over the person or suffering animal. 
The rest would have been disposed of through being taken to the fireside and handfuls poured over the fire or taken to the outside and spilled onto a rock they would deem special or worthy. As they poured the water onto the fireside, they would say the following words. Antil tain farmad, tilid tain farmad. Translated, this meant, will fire turn envy, fire will turn envy. So, saining with smoke. Labhar Bain, Juniper, and Kauran, mountain ash or rowan, were burnt on the doorstep of the buyer on the first day of the quarter, on Beltane Day and Hallow Mass. The buyer lintel was sprinkled with wine or failing wine with human urine. This was done to safeguard the cattle from mischance, mishap, and each other's horns. This is a section of the Carmina Gadelica, a book that is a compendium of prayers, hymns, charms, incantations, blessings, literary folklore poems and songs, proverbs, historical antidotes, natural history observations and miscellaneous law that was gathered in the Gaelic-speaking regions of Scotland between 1860 and 1909. Hallowmas or All Hallows is actually the day after Halloween, so it would have been on November 1st and overall was used as a feast to honour the saints. Over time, it became called All Hallows and started to then be referred to as Halloween. All Hallows is a day recorded as far back as before the year 1000 AD. Smoke saining would be used not just for festivals, but many other times throughout the year. So the most common plant they would use is juniper or rowan, and sometimes the smoke from a burnt bannock. So for any of you kitchen witches, bannock is a variety of Scottish skillet bread. It's a dense loaf that has a texture similar to that of a scone or a biscuit. Juniper is also new, known as a mountain yew, so it is said that this plant is a protection by the land and sea, and no house that it is within will take fire. Juniper pulled in a particular manner was burned before cattle and put in cows' tails. It was primarily used and burnt within households, and people and animals alike would sit within the smoke until they coughed and spluttered and had no choice but to leave and wait for the smoke to recede. This was usually a process carried out on New Year's Day. Juniper branches would often be hung above doors and windows on auspicious days or burned in the fire. So juniper had a dual purpose in being burnt. It was said to ward off evil spirits, but on a more practical level, it cleansed the home of pests and diseases. So they would dry out the branches beside the fire the night before and when all the windows and doors were shut, a fire would be lit in each room until the whole house was full of smoke. They would open the windows when people inside could no longer take the coughing and spluttering and then they would repeat the process in stables if they had them. Interestingly, the smoke of burning juniper is also used in Nepal for spiritual cleansing. So they use it within ceremonies such as those held before people embark on climbing Mount Everest. All magical plants had to be pulled in a certain manner. The druids had a level of considerable medical skill. They knew a lot in relation to botany and chemistry and to them fell the selection of the herbs for the mystic cauldron. They would gather these plants at certain phases of the moon. They would use certain magical rites during the periods of gathering, such as silence, sexual abstinence, a certain method of uprooting, and occasionally sacrifice of something. Long after the disappearance of the Druids, herbs found by sacred streams were still used to cure wounds, bruises, and other ills and traces of these Druids' rites still linger within folk tradition. So clearly pulling up a whole juniper bush to sain as they would have done in former times would not prove a responsible way of harvesting today or respectful to the land. However, juniper berries burnt perhaps in a cauldron with the use of a hot charcoal dish would work today. Juniper berries are easy to buy. You can even pick them up within your local supermarket and you can find them most places as it's native to the UK, Europe and much of the Northern Hemisphere. So it thrives on chalk lowland moorland, in rocky areas and old native pine woodlands. It's most often found as a low-growing spreading shrub or small tree. 
It's low maintenance and easy to grow and needs full sun and well-drained soil. This could be a wonderful way if you hold Scottish heritage to manage purification in line with the law of your Scottish ancestors. Saining in essence is the Scottish folk magic form of smoke cleansing. We can of course look to the traditions woven throughout folklore to provide us with a way to tie in with our bloodlines ways of purification. So following on from talking about saining, let's look at juniper which was integral in their form of purification. Juniper berries are the female seed cone produced by various species of junipers. It's not a true berry, but a cone with fleshy and merged scales, which gives it a berry-like appearance. It's used mainly in food for its spice, but also in gin for its distinctive flavour. Juniper berries may be the only spice derived from conifers. The common juniper native to the UK is Juniperus communis or common juniper. It has small needle like leaves that are green with broad silver bands on the inner side and they curve slightly to a sharp prickly point. They are pollinated via the wind and they have fleshy purple aromatic berry like cones. These are eaten and distributed by birds. So when the berries are young, they are green, but over 18 months, they mature to purple black. So common juniper is native to the UK, Europe and much of the Northern Hemisphere. It thrives on chalky lowland, moorland, in rocky areas and old native pine woodland. It's most often found as a low growing spreading shrub or small tree. You can grow your own juniper bush in a large plant pot or straight into the ground in your garden. And this is something that I'm going to be doing this year, incorporating it into my smoke purification processes. It's a native plant of the UK, yet it has been in a sharp decline since 2004 due to disease and fragmented populations. So you will need well-draining soil. It's really hardy, so great to grow as a beginner, as once planted, it doesn't require much TLC. It comes as a plug plant and you can plant it all year round. In mythology, juniper was considered a deterrent to the devil and witches. At the eve of Beltane, it was hung over doorways and burnt on Halloween to ward off evil spirits. It was said that you would prosper if you dreamt of gathering juniper berries in winter and the berries themselves signified honour or the birth of a boy. Juniper bushes were historically burnt on New Year's Day as a form of saining. Juniper berries have also been used along with rue to cleanse and fumigate the home prior to the celebration of Beltane. Some spiritual traditions are to rub juniper oils into your hands due to its purifying nature. It's long been considered as a purifying cleanser and as a protector against malignant and dangerous forces. So juniper is great to use in spells and charms relating to protection, power, strength, purification, contacting spirits, banishing, good luck, clarity, increased psychic visions, and sexual energy. It contains the fundamental energy of personal power and control. It's a very masculine herb and good for drawing in masculine energy. It can even be used by males to increase potency. It has long been seen as a herb that can banish anything detrimental to good health and it attracts good healthy energies and love. Easy ways to use juniper are as a string of juniper berries to attract love, burning it for magical protection, placing a sprig of juniper near a door or home or close to your valuables to protect against theft. You can also use juniper oil to increase money and prosperity. So juniper is also called Ginipro, Enebro and Watchholder. Its element is fire. It's related to the deity Astarte and the horned god. Its planet is the sun and ruling astrological sign is Cancer and Leo. But avoid using juniper berry essential oil during pregnancy or if you have kidney or liver disease as it may overstimulate them. Juniper berries were once considered a good method to terminate a pregnancy. 
You can use juniper berries to support the health of your urinary tract system by making up a tea or a tincture using them. Drink lots of water too alongside the tea if you find a UTI coming on. Again, if you do have any chronic kidney issues, do not attempt this as they can irritate your kidneys. You can add juniper berries for flavouring to savoury food sources. So one for the kitchen witches. They add a pungent spice to your food and you would need around 10 to add to say a pound of anything you are cooking them alongside for flavour. So you can burn them alongside charcoal within a cauldron or a heat proof pot in order to ward off negative energies. You can make a tincture from them to help clean wounds. So if you don't have a tincture already made for them, brew up a strong tea with the plant parts, not the berries. So juniper contains compounds that effectively kill certain dangerous yeasts and bacteria, which is why it's really good for putting onto wounds. So in order to make a juniper tincture, you would need to crush some juniper berries in a pestle and water to better release their oils. Add them to a jam jar and along with vodka, like so alcohol such as vodka, something that's at 80% and use three quarters of an ounce of berries per cup of alcohol. You can make a juniper tea by pouring boiling water over crushed dried juniper berries, then leave them to rest for a few minutes before drinking. And juniper is a really good digestive aid. It cleans the stomach, like it, it helps get rid of bloating. So if you drink a little juniper and ginger tea, especially after a healthy meal, if you've had too much salt, you might want to use it within a tea to flush your kidneys out. It helps with excess water retention, helps to get rid of the puffiness that is a common effect of too much salt. And you can, of course, make gin with juniper berries by infusing vodka with a few crushed berries. You can strain the berries and vodka after about a day or so or a longer period of time. Entirely up to you. If you want stronger taste, leave it for longer. But if you leave it too long, you will end up with a full-blown tincture to use for more medical needs. Juniper taken in small amounts is brilliant for anti-inflammation in the body. So use it alongside perhaps turmeric, black pepper and ginger, and it can support your joints and have you feeling better. So just as a guideline, like used in smaller amounts, juniper is considered safe. However, as stated, if you are pregnant, on any medications, have diabetes, are nursing, or have chronic liver or kidney issues, I wouldn't dabble with it unless you've consulted your, G your GP. I'm, of course, not a doctor. This is all for information only. I would just say that taking in small amounts, provided you have none of the above medical conditions, is the best way to start working with juniper and, of course, with any herbs. So you might want to try this incense for enhancing your psychic abilities. So take some dried thyme, dried juniper berries, charcoal. You want to burn them in a fire-safe cauldron or dish. So time is used for clairvoyance, divination and promoting psychic development. You could blend the two together and it is said to enhance your psychic abilities. So burn the two together over charcoal in your cauldron during meditation or divination. And you might want to make some moon powder. So for this, you will need sea salt, dried juniper berries, cinnamon, poppy seeds, allspice, clove, caraway and chamomile. So mix these in a mortar and store in a tub or jar and use this wonderful powder for moon spell work that relates to wisdom, psychic power, sleep, protection, luck, love, dreams, banishing and money. So that is all I have for you today on Scottish folk magic. Definitely a subject that I'd like to revisit and go into a little bit deeper on a further episode. I really wanted to say thank you for all the support for the last episode on soul loss and soul retrieval. I wasn't actually sure how that episode was going to go down. Had a few chats with like my mum, my friends, and I was like, oh, I don't know if like anyone actually wants to hit like talk about this or hear about it. It was a bit of a vulnerable episode, but I wanted to talk about the message, like how it links in with the shadow work, Dark Night of the Soul. And I had so many messages from you saying that you resound with a feeling of soul loss, similar relationships that you had 
I think there might be a flurry of people booking shamanic soul retrievals once this lockdown is all over. So I also would like to thank Helen Highwater and Blackbird who have supported the show recently. Thank you so much for your contribution. This all helps towards coffee and books, which of course keep the show running. I'm so grateful to you both and for your messages. Honestly made my day. You can support the show if you feel the call to through Acast, the host that I'm on, and there is a link in the show notes. Thank you for all your reviews and your messages. If you could support the show in one way, I would ask if you could leave me a review if you feel the call to. It means more people can find the show and this is my baby. I just want to keep doing it and getting it out there. So thank you as this helps me do that and you are helping me like create my dreams. So thank you. I am going to switch things up a bit as I have been sent a beautiful piece of music following on from our Music Witch episode that I wanted to play out on today's episode. So I'm going to see if I can pronounce this correctly. Papua Nero is a new project led by Sean Fisher. The name comes from his old cottage lake, Papinu, combined with One Neurology, the study of dreams. So dreams are often an inspiration for Sean's music, helping with the creation of otherworldly sounds. Mantis Moon is the first Papua Nero release. This song is completely made from live instrument recordings. The background synths are actually loops of a violin. The rain sounds are recordings that Sean took from his bedroom window. I love that. That's just so cozy. The wind chimes are attuned to chakras. So it ties in with our yoga for witches. And the weighted clapper is made of green jade. This was a gift from his grandmother, Margaret Minns, a gardener, crystal hound, and the caretaker of Papineau Lake. I love this piece of music. I hope you do too. Sean reached out and dropped me an email with this piece of music to see if I would, like, you know, see if I could show it to you all. You will fully understand why I love this song. There's a certain part, and I think that you will just absolutely get it. I love all of it, but just please give it a listen. I've added all the links in the show notes if you want to find Sean's work and to show him some love. So without further ado, here is Sean's piece of beautiful music. Lots of which he love. I will catch up with you all soon. Jewel at the waxing of its powers, 
with the right in your honor. I pray by the moon. I pray by the moon.